started. Um, uh, I want to I wanna take this opportunity to welcome you. Um, we are extremely pleased and honored to welcome Richard, Professor Richard Freeman to speak to us tonight uh, as part of the course, uh, CU summer course, uh, working in the quality in the global e economy. Um, Dr. Freeman will talk to us tonight about the role of labor institutions in the global economy. Critical, pressing issue, uh, particularly during this period of, of economic crisis. Richard Freeman is the, uh, holds the Herbert Asherman Chair in Economics at Harvard University. He's the faculty, faculty director of the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School. He's the director of the National Bureau of Economic Research in the Sloan Science Engineering Workforce Projects. He's a senior research fellow in labor markets at the London School of Economics Center for Economic Performance. In addition to over 300 articles to date, he's written uh, several books. Let me just give you a sample of some of his most recent titles. Um, in 2007, the second edition of What Workers Want was published. Um, 2004, Can Labor Standards Improve Under Globalization? 2005, Emerging Labor Market Institutions in the 21st Century. 2007, America Works, The Exceptional Labor Market. 2007, What Workers Say, Employee Choice in the Anglo-American World. And his forthcoming book um, is the IZA Prize book uh, titled Making Europe Work. I think it's safe to argue that Dr. Freeman is uh, one of the most important, certainly one of the most active and influential labor economists working in the world today. Um, he's really uh, single-handedly uh, expanded the discipline to include previously ignored or undervalued concerns, including um, how to sustain the welfare state uh, and the role of trade unions in the global economy. Um, what is the role of trade unions in a global economy? Um, as well as thinking seriously and critically about issues of discrimination and inequality, which is the, certainly the central focus for those of us in the work and inequality course, uh, uh, but I imagine a, a central concern to people around the world. Uh, uh, perhaps most importantly, in addition to the academic side of his work, um, he's uh, active and aggressive in influencing public policy, um, not just in North America or the Western Hemisphere, uh, but around the world. In fact, uh, for those of you not in the course, uh, I should tell you that he was supposed to lecture to our class yesterday morning, and he couldn't because he had to give uh, an emergency talk to the uh, social and labor ministers for the EU. Um, so we lost him for the day, had to reschedule him today. It's just, I think, underscores um, his importance and influence um, in, in speaking to policymakers about what their range of options are, particularly um, during the crisis that we find ourselves in. So I would argue um, that his voice and vision are more vital today than ever um, as we face growing inequalities um, amidst a global labor crisis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Freeman uh, tonight. can't live up to those uh, kind words, um, but, but maybe I'll have some cool pictures that will live up to the, to the kind of words. Is this here? Oh, that's words. Yeah, that's okay. That's one. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to talk not just about labor uh, and, and, and unions, what they can do, because I don't think I'll give you some good reasons. I don't think they can do by themselves, that they have the strength to do uh, what, what is actually needed. And so I put in NGOs. And later on, I'll add religious and community groups. Uh, it, it has to be a wide group of people to do this. And I'll explain this. This is, a, uh, I believe, the Athens Olympic uh, race. And uh, the person to pay attention to you probably don't know her unless you're British. I think only the Brits paid a lot of attention. The other thing I thought I would do as an economist speaking to a group that's mostly sociologists, I know the sociologists have never seen the invisible hand. And so there you are, guys. And let me just say, because you will notice 
there's a right hand, and holy mackerel, there's a left hand. And uh, that's meant to express the fact that, in fact, the invisible hand is not a right-wing uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, only right-wing economists believe does, uh, uh, does what, they, what they like. Um, in fact, it, it does a lot of things that uh, even sociologists should, should, should be impressed by and should like. The, what, I, what I want to talk about is, 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 is these three things. Uh, first, is the, we, if we're going to think of what we want unions or other social organiz, organization, organizations to do in building a new, uh, you know, improving our economy, we got to say something about what's, what that new economy is like. I use the word peak here because for a period of time, the Europeans in particular, I think, uh, thought of the U.S. as the peak capitalist economy, and you've got to copy what the Americans are doing. And that was quite a uh, thing. And I think uh, Americans were always a little uh, more uh, uneasy that we were such a great thing, because we see everybody sees their own uh, mistakes and errors, weaknesses better than perhaps uh, people outside do. So I'm going to give what I think is, is uh, some, some vision of that, at least. And then the, 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 the main thing is going to be that in order to sort of rein in what has been the excesses of capital that we've seen in the global economy, um, we're going to need something called countervailing power. And um, I went back to look at what Galbraith had to say about that. And sadly, his book deals with countervailing power things. Not much. His book on the Great Depression is remarkably good. And it, it literally, you could just follow events and you could see us moving step by step following the, the past uh, history. But um, the, his, his actual analysis of countervailing power is not very uh, good. Um, so it turns out there isn't very much in, in economic analysis. And there may be things in political science that, that I don't know. But uh, I will talk about the unions, NGOs, internet, other things. How do you have to build something to offer an alternative view of actual policies to what the financial community will be and is offered today? And then this has got to be, uh, unions have to be a major part of this because they are the one group that can deliver large numbers of people. And that's very important because the other side of this can deliver uh, a few people with billions and billions of dollars. And uh, you, have to, sort of, you, need, you need something big on the other side. I realized George Soros uh, gave money, founded this, and he's one of the few billionaires who is on the labor side of most of, 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 of these uh, things. But uh, he's a bit of an outcast, let me uh, be blunt, uh, in that because of this. So his billionaire friends uh, don't invite him to their parties uh, and so on. Um, I suppose they're not his friends is the correct thing. And I will talk a, a bit about the US because we are such an important country. And uh, the president is committed to a new labor law. And, and, and that will change some of the position of the, of the, of, of the unions. But they're going to have to change as well. Okay, the background, you, you know there's Wall Street. Oh, that's the uh, debt coming to the Wall Street as the share prices fall. And there are these great wise guys wondering what their exposure is. Um, and it turns out they're all naked. Um, and as you know, they don't know that they, they still don't know. And we still don't know their exposure on the toxic assets. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And we had a, 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 a test, stress test. The stress test in the US meant that the banks will not go out, have enough capital that they will not crash in the next two years under, let's say, reasonably you know, under, you know, conservative uh, things. What's going to happen in the third year? That was not covered in the stress test. Uh, and that's because these assets are not valued. We don't know what their value is. And there's a big fight about whether you should try to find out what their value is, or let the banks keep calling the value whatever they want. 
then there, there's some plausibility on both sides because if 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 at this moment you you they they put some up for price up for, for, for sale, they would go at very very low prices, probably probably lower than their true long term value, and that would would just bring the whole system to an end. And so they're sort of allowing them this, but it's not it's not a very safe situation. What this produced is a global recession. Um, there's unemployed Americans, and there's the U.S. unemployment rate. Uh, this is the, uh, that's, not, that's not the rate, that's the prediction market price of will the rate be over 10% at the end of this year. You see those share prices going up. Going up, when it reaches uh, the 90, 90 cents for the dollar, that means there's a 90% chance that the, the, the market is saying 90% chance. There's a comparable thing for, 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 for the European Union, and the European Union one is between 11 and 12%. But it's not as good a graph because the shares have just been put uh, on, the, uh, on the, this in-trade market recently, and it doesn't seem like Europeans have quite the American desire to bet on how bad the economy is going to be. And so it's a, it's a thin market, and so the, the price is from choice. What, what I remarked in this was, this share price kept going up even after the president's announced the stimulus package. I mean, nobody thinks it's going to have any effect on unemployment through this year. They haven't yet begun offering, uh, you know, for, for the next year, the share prices, uh, so you can bet. The two stores uh, there are stores from my hometown. Uh, uh, and if you go along, just understand the, the depths of this recession, but, but, uh, and I don't know how it. In, 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 in Budapest it is, but in the Boston area, which is one of the more prosperous areas of the U.S., you go and you walk down main streets and you just see empty store after empty store after empty store. And uh, I mean eight continuous empty stores uh, on a main shopping street. It's unbelievable. So these are places going out of business and uh, stores for sale and so on. So we, we th this is a very deep so what went wrong? Um, and, then, and there's a set of, of, of analyses that people have done. Just the um, this this particular gentleman, the million dollar man. Um, he's a uh, professional. He was a professional wrestler, and he wrote a book. And he every man has his price. And I think he was the wisest of people in this particular thing. And his fame was he would go into the wrestling ring. And he would, uh, to, in order to win a match, he would first give out, and of course he would be done quote, secretly, with the cameras on it and the fans all screaming, don't take the money to some good guy wrestler and say, here's a lot of money, and if you won't take it, I'm gonna hire four guys to beat you up, and the four guys would appear, and so on. And, and so his famous slogan, and then he used for his book, uh, 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 is, and it's, it's um, yeah, every man is surprised. So that's the incentive side of this. There were huge incentives for risk taking. There was huge incentives for crime and near crime. I mean, you could make a lot of money being a, a bad guy. Uh, there was regulatory failure. The agencies failed, and the Wall Street. There are some other reasons that I, I just will put aside, um, but that may come up in discussion. Certainly, the uh, certainly the Bush administration very strongly, though they panicked in the end and. And through bailouts, did everything against their own ideology. They were committed to free markets. Alan Greenspan was committed to free markets. And uh, so were many economists. And it turns out in this crunch, almost everybody except nuts have, have shifted over. The nuts may be right, but we'll see what happens. But it's, it's unbelievable the way people have, have who, who thought Keynes was a dirty word and uh, have believed in, in free markets will cure themselves. They all, in the, when, the, when the crisis went off, they jumped towards uh, stimulus packages in, in the U.S. to an extraordinary extent. I was just amazed. I was just like people who six months earlier would have been uh, saying, uh, "You're you know that this is crazy policy." Jumped on. There's trust in financial engineering. There's the uh, hypothesis that it's all due to male sexuality and testosterone, and there are some scientific papers that have worked on that. The religious right has blamed it on moral collapse. People did not believe enough in, 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 in God. 
and, and morality, and maybe it was gay sex, and this is the Lord punishing us all in the whole. You can find that all on the web if you're interested in, in some of that, in that analysis. And there was a culture of, of Wall Street. Uh, on. Part of, the, uh, of a problem, I think, from the economics profession point of view, was we had a lot of analyses of inequality executive compensation. And that was a real hot topic. And it was all about how more inequality uh, was good, because you energized the really superstars of our society. And so then you wanted them to produce things for the benefit of the shareholder. And so what you gave them was you, you linked their options to, uh, the stock options to pay. Uh, excuse me, they're linking the pay to, to performance. So you measured their, uh, you gave them huge sums if the company turned profitable. Nobody in my profession was either uh, I don't know, smart enough or suspicious enough to ask who's reporting the performance and could they manipulate the figures? And it turns out there was an awful lot of, of misreporting of performance. Uh, the minimum is 10% of US companies managed to misreport performance precisely when the executives' comp, uh, options were being due. So you report very profitable things at that moment, they clear out, and then they, it, it's very hard to claw back that money. Uh, you, you, it, it's extremely difficult uh, to do that. And uh, there's this technical thing of looting, which they destroy, they basically sacrifice the long term value of the company for their short term profits. This is a weird man. Uh, slightly before, he said that the markets were reducing risk. And this, I said, me, the financial guru, told you, so these are things that are literally unbelievable to read now. And you say, this was supposed to be the wisdom of the conventional American uh, uh, financial community. Less vulnerable to shocks. Financial system, more resilient. Uh, someone asked him, gee, you know, these big banks, aren't they getting a little dangerous? They're getting to be like monopolies. And, you know, six or eight huge banks. We now have but uh, some of them are gone now, so we're down to maybe four of them or something. Um, and doesn't it mean that they're, they're, and he said, nope, they're fully hedged. It is, seems superfluous to constrain trading in some of the newer derivatives. Risks are being regulated by private parties. There is nothing in federal regulation which makes it superior to market regulation. Um, we all better hope that there is something in government regulation that makes it superior to market regulation because the market failed utterly. I mean, he then went to Congress in, the, in, in November, this, uh, not November, it was earlier than that, for this fall, and testified that everything I believed in has been proven wrong. Um, but he's now wiggling back from that, you know, sort of, uh, that, that position. Uh, but he, he, he was honest, he said this. Uh, this uh, some of you've seen these kind of things. Um, these are just the executives off and they did exactly what narrow economics said they should do, which is namely try to profit from the system. And if you read any discussion of bank regulation now, you will see that everybody, and I mean everybody, is sitting there saying, we know what they're going to do now. But we, we weren't smart enough to see that they were going to be doing whatever they could to maximize their, you know, almost like the economists did not believe their own economics model enough. Uh, it, 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 in that sense, it's, it's remarkable. Here you're teaching, and here you've got people. Uh, uh, and here are people with, with money coming out their ears and wearing, I don't know, five or six one, two, three, four, uh, pinky rings uh, on every finger. Uh, you, you sort of should know that they're probably the closest thing you'll ever come to, to the, uh, the, the narrow economic man. That's all they care about. And that's the way they behave. Oh, plus they got expensive watch, too, um, et cetera. So we have this problem. Now, here uh, um, is another aspect of this. And um, the devil made me do it is, is an interesting form. But who is the devil in this case? The devil is basically the incentives being offered by the big companies. And they told me to sell subprime mortgages, and I get 500 k a year in a year. That's pretty good earnings. Good gracious. Uh, and there he is with the contract. I put here, it, it's, it's a German thing for the Milgram experiment. And, and, and just want everybody to remember what happened to people who went into the Yale Milgram experiments and the Stanford Zimbardo experiments. Um, the, sta the, actually the, uh, the Stanford ones, in some sense, are a little more uh, interesting because they divided a group of students. 
someone in his prisoners, someone in his prison guards. They told the prison guards, your job is to you know, treat these guys like dirt, you the rules. And the students did this to their same students. In the Milgram ones, you know, they told you to torture people. And, uh, and you, people would be screaming. You'd hear these screams from the other room. And uh, uh, you know, people said, do this. Well, these y young people went to all these banks, and they were told what to do. They were told, sell these things. Do this. Go out on the, the floor and, and, and trade. Um, and, and you'll make lots of money. And we, the senior executives, <laughs> will make even more money than you'll make. But we're all going to make lots of money, and this is all fine. And so they went into a culture in which this was the behavior, and that's what they did. And a number of them feel guilty. They're not giving back their money, but they feel guilty about this. Here's another group of people who said, don't blame us. And this is, these are the labor, the groups I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the labor, the NGOs, nonprofit, religious groups. And I should add uh, the, uh, the higher institutions of higher education. My university did nothing. They, we, we went with this. We, our best students, you know, the Harvard, it's pretty good students. Forty percent of last, year, not, not this past year, but the year before his class, went to Wall Street jobs. <coughs> Meaning, we took the, the the most called out group of people in the U.S. and possibly the world. We have a lot, we have a chunk of, of, of students from China. We have a chunk of students from Central America. Uh, uh, we don't get too many uh, Brits and, and uh, French. Germans, just more reason. Uh, and what did we do? We sent them off to Wall Street. So I should have added that here. I did. Okay, and then those are, you know, there's the uh, 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 the, uh, the straw man who's got no brain. So we weren't smart enough. There's the uh, cowardly lion. We weren't brave enough to stand up and say to multi-billionaires, hey, you know, this is wrong. Or to tell young people uh, who were going off to these careers to say, I mean, I said things like, you, you got a, a job at uh, Morgan Stanley for $150,000 starting pay? I said, wow, that's pretty good. I hope you remember your economics and we do, you know, dot, dot, dot. Instead of, and it's very hard to say somebody's got a you know, fairly lucrative job to say, oh boy, you're probably selling your soul. Uh, <laughs> um, you shouldn't do this. Um, and, 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 and the tin man who's not strong enough. So uh, uh, we don't This is an economic analysis, not by an economist, but by the president of the United States, and who just says the whole hey, this whole system is bad. And then I wanted to offer something. Well, the president in, in, the, in the U.S. and I don't think in the world there is a serious alternative. Um, everything is about well, we'll limit, or we'll regulate, and we'll do something to limit this 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 version of capitalism. And um, lo and behold. Uh, we have a uh, we have a, a, a version on on, on, on sale, uh, and, 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 and so I, I list a bunch of things. The key thing, and I'll talk a little more about how this is advanced in, in the in the U.S. Um, and I'll say something about it in Europe, is basically giving incentives and ownership stakes to everybody in the company, not just the CEOs and the people at the very top. So it's a democratization of capitalism. Uh, now there's a danger to that. And uh, we just have a, a new NDR book that will be coming out about this. And the, uh, one of the referees were very really, uh, concerned uh, about, and correctly so, if I as a worker have my capital, some of my capital, in the same company that I'm working for, that's a double risk. That company goes down, I lose my job, and I lose my investments. Now, one of my, my answers is, yeah, but it may be safer to do that than to have it in one of these Wall Street funds, uh, or, 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 et cetera. Um, in any case, so that's, I'm going to say a little bit about that, not too much, because that's the whole thing we there. The big problem that people have uh, with any sort of shared capitalist activity, and I don't know how this, the guys doing these projects that have them uh, going on, it's obviously as a free rider. So I and you, and the three of us are working together on a team. And uh, gee, I say, great, are you guys going to work on it tonight? Sorry, I uh, don't feel good. And I go out to the local pub and have fun. And there's always a question of, will, the, will a group of people work hard, or will there be free riders? So the free rider bicycle is a, is a bicycle. You see the guy in the back. Um, 
he doesn't have to move his feet. Nobody's going to know. And of course, the economic analysis of this is, he, he says, well, why should I work? Uh, I'm not going to add very much to the speed of the bike. There's a lot of guys there. And if you're in a big company, what you can do is pretty, pretty minuscule to the, to the ultimate value of the firm. And then, of course, the guy in front of you says the same thing. And so the, the claim has always been that this whole, any, any time you have workers uh, owning, sharing responsibility, free riding is going to wipe out the, the, the operation. So there's a solution. And you can buy this bike, where you are face to the other people <laughs> who are pedaling. Um, it's a very expensive bike. And you have to be pretty wealthy to, for this particular bike. It's, it's sold by, what is it, Hammaker Schle Schle It's a Texas place for a very wealthy store. Uh, store. But you can get free their, um, their catalog. It's a very interesting catalog. For, you know, things that uh, if you did have $10 million, $20 million a year income, you might consider buying. Uh, um, but what this really reflects is, is, is the way any form of more shared capitalist activity has to be. And we have, a, we have studies with a lot of companies that operate this way. Basically, the people who have to monitor are not, are not the, the bosses or the employees. It's the workers who have to monitor the workers. I don't know how you people did dealt, that dealt with this in, in your in projects. You're doing joint projects. I see somebody goes up to someone and says, hey, Mary, you know, you weren't at the last meeting. Uh, you tell us you're going, you're, you don't feel good and uh, you got to go to the next meeting. Well, you better shape up or else. And it turns out that's extremely effective in workplace groups. No one likes uh, to, to have that and uh, that, that's successful. It's sufficiently successful that this brand of capitalism, I say, well, has it met a market test? And this is US data. European data is shows much less of this in Europe, even though they're probably the two most successful places in the world in this, this form of capitalism are, are in, in Europe. This property, unfortunately, we, we, we do these surveys, um, a national survey. Um, uh, we won a big national uh, competition to ask these questions. And then they told us, oh, and by the way, you have to pay $60,000 or something to add the questions to the national survey. Uh, and we, 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 we actually were able to round up the money from some companies and people who felt it really was a valuable to have these statistics. So we won't have the next one until 2010. And that will be really interesting to see what's happened to this, to this kind of a system. But what you notice is profit sharing plans, it went up, uh, uh, and it's 38%. Uh, Receive some of the profits. Well, some companies are not profitable. So you, you should be that you don't receive profit shares. If everybody received it, we would think it's maybe a bogus scheme uh, of some sort. Gain sharing is local profit sharing, which you can have in a public sector, meaning if you meet some targets, you get uh, some extra, extra money. But it's basically group incentives. And then the question of how many receive that? So you see 21%. Uh, the, the fraction of Americans who own company stock, you see, went down. And that's in, in response to the dot-com crash, in the large part. But we still have 17.5%, and we'll see what it looks like in 2010. These are workers company in their own company. And then stock options uh, also went down. But if you sum up all of these things, you know, it's, it went, actually went up because of the profit sharing went up on kind of, kinds of things, gain sharing. That's 46.7%. That's an awful lot of the US the economy has some form of this kind of shared capitalism. In other words, your, the statistics for Europe, I, I, I have them on a different slide. Uh, I didn't put them in this, this talk. So I didn't want to spend too much time on this. I just want to say there is, there is a reasonable vision out there of how you can make the capitalist system more uh, uh, re reducing inequality. Because once everybody shares in the profits, the CEOs and the top executives, they just can't take, all, take that much. That's, that's just, just, just the way it is. Everybody's covered by the same rules. They get proportionally more. They get more, but not proportionately more. They get more because they're higher paid. And, and so you, you, but everybody benefits in, in these uh, kind of systems. The European uh, figures um, show more in the order of 20% numbers, even though the French have insisted that everybody do, do, does profit sharing. There's a law in France saying it's profit sharing. And the Europe, Europe does have this pepper, 
had this PEPPER report a number of years ago. Will I remember what the PEPPER stands for? I won't. But participation, profit sharing, something, 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 something. So the EU actually has endorsed this kind of 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 a of a of a, of a, of a schema, and uh, it certainly offers an alternative to the Wall Street uh, 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 operation, where a few people at the top are making and involved in uh, everything. I did say also just so Europe has the two most successful firms in this activity. One is um, any, anybody here ever uh, bought things in the in London? What's the best uh, the department store in London? Probably the world. What? No, Harrods, heaven forbid. No, not more expensive. You got, you, got you got a lot of posh stores here. I mean, ah, there we go, John Lewis. It's, no, it's, it's, it's without question. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it is without question. It's the only time I've ever been in a store where they said, you know, you don't really want to buy this product. But there's a cheap store down the block. Did you have the same experience? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Because they are, they've been trained that they are there for customers, and and, and that they and they're, they're it's all it's employee owned. Uh, employees have shares, they paid shares, and it is a it is a totally different experience. Um, and they're weathering the storm much better than a lot of other. John Lewis. Yeah, I'm not nothing against parents and nothing against liberty and nothing against the others, but I don't think they, they remotely compare uh, to, to, to John Lewis. Uh, the other place is the Mondragon operation in Spain, which is employee owned and is also seems to be weathering the storm. So, so Europe has, does have some very striking uh, examples of business. Okay. Now, like I pointed out toward this, or earlier this morning, you know, greed is powerful. There's our symbol of greed. That's Gordon Gecko, uh, a, a great American. Um, but it isn't everything. We have a lot of information. I won't go through the experiments that we talked about this morning, people. Uh, but that just says there's a lot more involved in human nature than greed. So we have this powerful greed, and we have this something else. Now I want to move to what is to be the, the, the theme here. How are we going to strengthen the countervailing power, which is critical if we're going to reform the capitalist system from it's, the disaster it's just falling into? And I put, uh, you know, this, gosh, he's got a dog. It's a dog, woman, baby, and there's money on the other side. And the idea is to balance out the great power that these financial institutions that money has in the system. Um, and there you have all the workers, and there's the boss on the other side uh, breaking, I believe, the law by smoking with a bunch of employees around, because that's illegal in most countries at this point, because that bad smoke. But he's far enough away, maybe he's not breaking the law. OK, so what should we do? These are uh, this is a picture of lobbyists in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, there's one of them down there. You can see the person. Uh, <laughs> One of the things you have to operate against is a system in which companies find it extraordinarily profitable to hire particularly retired politicians with great connections to write the legislation in the country. The Australia had a labor law under Mr. John Howard called Works Choice, which is 800 pages, incredible labor law. Got him tossed out of office, uh, Mr. Howard. But I, 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 when I was asked to go and do some analysis of this law, and I started reading it. It was the most incredible thing. I could not understand how anyone could a, read it or write it. And then I go to Australia, and I ask one of his aides. I said, well, how this law is insane? And the guy said, well, we didn't write it. Well, who did? The company law, uh, law firms who lost cases in the courts <laughs> Every case is now reversed. So the law, the law was a list of every case that, it, you know, so, and, and the lobbyists wrote it, and the, the prime minister's team didn't even read the bloody law. I, I hope in the US, and I'm not going to vouch for it, that somebody in our Congress reads some of the laws that get passed. But they, 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 they saw, uh, many of the lobbyists write the laws, and, and that goes on. OK. This is. Um, the crony capitalism thing sets the rules. We had an FBI financial fraud unit. The 
Um, the, the guys who, who protect the uh, President of the United States, the, the, the Secret Service, they were originally set up not to protect the President, because nobody really thought Presidents needed that much protection until you know, th things developed. They were set up originally to stop uh, white collar crime, and uh, uh, particularly counterfeiting. They were a counterfeiting agency. But, so they moved off. The SEC, which is our agency, didn't uh, investigate Mr. Madoff, even though they were warned. We had a list, I have a student working on this, as to how much the Wall Street contributions went to everybody on every banking committee in the US. So I know that the, the following six Congress people sit on the banking committee, and therefore I contribute large sums to their uh, uh, campaigns. One of the Congress people who was pointed out in the newspaper, having received a large sum for this, Democrat from Connecticut, his, his, his comment was, well, I, I never let my campaign contributions affect how I vote. And he voted 100% the way the financial industry wanted him to vote against some reforms that the administration was, was favoring. Um, that was kind of silly. So I just leave that, that all of these guys are in black space. Um, this is, this says, there's a model here that we've developed as economists, and it doesn't have this crony capitalism in it. And that's kind of what we need countervailing power for. If we take that this crony, cr I call it crony capitalism, meaning all these lobbyists and all these people and the, the, these finance guys determining the rules, uh, uh, rewarding people before and after they take government jobs, I mean, we, Americans thought of this, oh, this is, is India with the licenses uh, given out. This is Indonesia with the family things. This is Latin America. This is Russia, perhaps. Well, it looks like it's pretty universal. You know, maybe not in Sweden. You know, Sweden sort of seem to be a special in a sense. Or they, or they all went to the same high school in a small country, and they all know each other, and it's a little more difficult to rip off your high school chums or something like that. In uh, any case, I want to offer first a very uh, speculative thought. I can't prove this. Because if, if we end up with this crony capital as the natural state of capitalism, then the question becomes, do you need some offsetting powers, things, to fight it in order to bring us closer to the invisible hand? Ideal. I mean, certainly the, the whole of antitrust policy was based on this notion that we would end up with these huge companies, and so we built antitrust policies to cut them down to size. Uh, it turns out the financial sector is the one place we have no antitrust policies. And people instead say, oh, these banks, they're, they're so important that they're so big and so gigantic, and et cetera. So I point out here that. You know, labor view has always been that you need something inside firms to protect workers. Um, and you just can't trust just competition among firms. And I just put a question mark here uh, on whether this could be very helpful, particularly for regulators. Let's say we assume that we could make a legitimate case that if you had institutions of greater countervailing power, you would end up with uh, a more constrained capital a market which would be safer for everybody. And you would be, the regulators would now have pressures not to uh, ignore regulations, but in fact to apply the regulations. A has to be a group out there. So where are they going to come from? And that's what I want to uh, talk about in the next few minutes. Well, the one you immediately think of trade unions. Uh, in the US in particular, they're pretty weak. Um, again, we may ex it may think the Nordic countries may still ha have still strong unions. I don't think the unions in Hungary are particularly strong. I never could figure out which was a legitimate union in, in Russia. The Chinese unions are controlled by the state. Uh, the British unions are very, very weak. The German unions have proved themselves not to be particularly e effective or efficient. You go, I mean, and the French unions, who knows? I mean, because they don't really have strong unions, but somebody yells, Mala Marseillaise, to the streets, and everybody in France goes out, and the whole country closes down. I was once in the office of a, a parliamentarian from the right-wing party when there was a, a strike, 
in, 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 in taxi drivers or some, some, there's always a strike of trains or taxis or something. And I was having to get to, 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 to London on the, on the train and I was getting very upset. Uh, and I said, this is terrible. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? This is wonderful. This is France. This is the people. And I said, but they're, stri they're striking against you and your government. And he said, who cares? I'm with the people. <laughs> OK, so the French have something special on this. Uh, I mean, and I say here, the unions tend to be very bureaucratic and reactive. You don't have that many bright young people arising very quickly in the unions. Uh, uh, you go back in history, yeah, there was some very young, young people came up very quickly when they formed unions, but nowadays it's a big bureaucracy. The EU social partners, well, I was just in Brussels, the social partners were the, oh, not Brussels, excuse me, I was in Stockholm, we can be you guys. And it, you don't get a sense of incredible life. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy there, all very similar. I've been very favorable to what I call white hat activists. And this is um, sort of almost Lone Ranger type NGO groups that can raise a ruckus. They have certainly forced a number of companies in the global market to get their act together. You know, Nike, they, they got Nike to switch completely. They're putting pressure now on Starbucks which has this uh, coffee made with good conditions. And I've asked Starbucks any number of times, can you just tell me how much of the money, the, the good conditions money is going to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, you know, the workers? And they refuse to tell. And um, so, so there's got to be, so they, we're not sure what they're quite doing. Because obviously I can label anything as good conditions. I mean, I treat all of my workers, with, I'm a good conditions professor. Uh, I treat everybody honestly. Honey, what do you know? Uh, we need some verification of this. Uh, the Move On Board and social networks were extraordinarily effective in mobilizing US public uh, uh, opinion in this last election. And then we have internet information sites that just, it, it, I mean, it is, it seems to me that we have a technology that will, can allow incredible uh, uh, mustering of citizen power and authority. And let me and and you say, you don't need that many people to create a ruckus and cause problems for companies or so on. Um, I'll say a little bit about one later in the moment about one of the most sensible AFLC health events. In the US, what we have seen is before this crash, I don't have any data for the post the crash, the, the crash. Before the crash, while well, inequality was going up, and uh, workers were just not sharing in the, in the benefits. The blue line is the fraction of workers who say they would vote union. The red line is the fraction who say they would not vote for union. Traditionally, roughly, I would say uh, uh, a third of the workers would say, I, yeah, I want 30, 30 to 40%. Say, yeah, I want a union in my workplace. But in the US, it's a, you, you, win a you win a majority, you get 100%, or you get zero. And I was stunned, and years ago, a couple of years ago, when I saw these lines go above, the first time ever in the US history. So there's clearly people are, are aching for some sort of countervailing force uh, uh, to, to, to what we have. Meaning coverage has gone down in the US. It finally blipped up in 2007. And uh, it may have gone up a little bit even in 2008. Uh, but some of that, the union density goes up. It's because a lot of non-union workers are losing their jobs. And uh, the union guys tend to be more skilled. They're more public sector. Uh, they're the professional athletes. They're the actors and actresses. They're the airline pilots. Um, you know, the automobile company thing maybe, maybe will push, push it down. Um, but they, they've had a war with employers that haven't been able to afford that. If you, you have 14% or 13.3%, excuse me, organized, and 50, over 50% 50 of the workers want to be unionized, you know something is wrong in the way the society is, is dealing with this. So your major, I think is your, your, your central part of any kind of power has just been weakened beyond um, the union. Now we have Mr. Obama as president. Um, um, and this is a statement that uh, if I said this at some economics convention a few years ago, uh, they would have tried to cart me off as some sort of extreme leftist of some kind. They first would say, well, the unions and their organizers, they don't lift up the middle class. 
They're a special interest group that just does something for a, a few insiders. That would be the, the kind of claim. And uh, they would say, look, the, the market's doing everything. Um, and well, why should we bother with this? They're seeking a particular law now. Uh, it's called EFCA, Employee Free Choice Act, which wants to take change from uh, having an election to having workers sign cards. Uh, and you sign a card, and that means you have basically voted for the union. The fear of the employers is a bunch of union guys will surround somebody and kind of pressure the workers to uh, sign a card when they really don't want to. The real fear of the employers is they won't be able, in these campaigns, what they do is they bring each worker in separately to the supervisor, and, and uh, the supervisor reads them a riot act of what will happen if the, they unionize. And that would, they couldn't do that if, if they, if, uh, under the, the card procedure. If cards, you could just do it very quickly. And, uh, and they'll, something will happen. I don't think that they'll pass that law, but uh, they'll, they'll do something. Like I say, there'll be some compromise. You know, what might this, if this law were to pass, what would, the, what would happen in the country? Would you see 50% unionization? Well, there's some conservative folks who are screaming, you're going to see 50% unionization, huge increases in wages. And that will just make the recession a million times worse. And so as a desire to preserve the, the, the economy, uh, there's a conservative groups out there saying, you must fight this union law, because it's really a law that's going to create unemployment. My estimate is that in the private sector, they'll raise density a little bit, because they have clumsy bureaucratic organizations. And even with a law that was very favorable bill, I don't think they could actually do it. Then I, I wrote this a, 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 a bit before we were, we were still don't know it's going to be a Great Depression. Then you might see something, because at that point, the workers could just simply say, we don't care about the unions. We're going to form our own unions, because we've got to have something to protect ourselves in a Great Depression. That's what happened in the US in the Depression of the 1930s. It also happened in every European country in Australia and Canada. Unions grew in the Depression, in all the countries that weren't conquered by, by Hitler, or, 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 you know, or the, or, or the, uh, or the figure that you look at. It was, they didn't grow in Germany, <laughs> Hitler was in there. They didn't grow in Italy, uh, et cetera. But the, and I suppose they didn't grow in Spain. During the period. But every country that free, 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 free democracy, they grew in the, in, the, in the Depression. So depressions tend, workers tend to lose their faith in the system, as they correctly should. And they go to form some kind of organization to protect them. And unions are a natural thing. And so I could see, I said here, could you see a 10 point rise? It would be my thing of what might happen if, if everything worked out as well. And that would bring unionism in the US back to what it was when Ronald Reagan was president. And uh, so I tell the unions, that's the good old days for you guys. If you could only bring back Ronald Reagan, you thought he was a bad guy. Uh, really, he was, he, that was that was a good time for unions compared to what it is up to then. They, if they're going to play a role in, in really being a countervailing force to capital to change the economy, they have to do more than old-fashioned collective bargaining. They cannot keep doing the same stuff. They have huge pension funds in the U.S. and the Dutch unions and, and, uh, have giant uh, pension funds. The Swedish unions also have. They pay their pension funds, their workers and pension funds, where unions are on the boards and the funds. Exactly good. Most countries, they do not play much, uh, 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 much of a role, but that gives them great power, potential power in the capital market. Very important. They can fund things. Our unions have been forming uh, alliances, New <coughs> Green, where they work with the Sierra Club and other with environmentalists. And these were groups that our unions typically would environmentalists. My God, my members are steel workers. We pollute. That's, uh, that's how we produce steel. And uh, you're endangering our jobs. Well, they've done a complete about face, the steel workers and a lot of the other unions. And then I, th this, uh, unions do have a, one, one major person working in, part of, working in the Congress on, on some of these things. They have to be a major player in rewriting re all these roles. If, if the rules for the new capitalist system, new regulations, are going to be written by the same Wall Street guys, we'll get some rules out, you know, and there'll be some restrictions, and it's not going to be uh, exactly better than we have, but it certainly is not going to be very much. And so I say the unions have to behave differently. 
They, I said also they need intellectual openness. Um, and that's difficult. American unions are particularly difficult for, you can think about what you know about your own unions. Uh, the connections they have with academics, the connections they have in where the people have honest discourse and so on. One of my friends in the, uh, in the American trade movement says, we are the last Stalinist organization in the world. Uh, meaning that once they make an agreement on what the, pro the, 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 uh, the union line is, even if you disagree, you're, you are a traitor to open your mouth, then they don't carry a way to, to a gulag or something. But, but it's, it's very, very a thing. And, it's, and so I showed here two, two old union leaders. That the, the, uh, oh, this is, you, you may not know uh, I'm All Right Jack. It's a wonderful movie about an old British union leader. And Peter Sellers was the thing. And he was a union leader who was leading the workers but he was always looking out for himself. You know, can I uh, do something like that? And that's Jimmy Hoffa. His son is now in control of the Teamsters here in the, in the United States. Jimmy Hoffa was, of course, ki killed. We don't know where his body is buried. We believe it's somewhere in New Jersey, uh, the Garden State. Okay. This was um, a few days ago in the U.S. And then it, it turns out this another version of this story appeared in today's New York Times on the front page. Right now, the American unions who you're asking to step up, one hopes in, our, in, the, in this archive, will step forward and be part of a, 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 a broad coalition of counter railing force to help right the, the, the sort of the good ship capitalism. They ended up fighting each other. Um, AFSCME President Jerry McEntee is a um, Oh, he's a leader of sorts. So he is, SEIU is the Service Employees International Union. That's uh, the, probably the, 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 one of the biggest and most powerful for poaching of another union. Uh, the laborers president described their actions as deplorable. Uh, the change to win leader, these are all leaders of, the, we have two federations now in the US. We have the AFL-CO and we have the change to win. The change to win is supposed to be the, the more progressive, uh, positive guys. This is the change to win guys denouncing the biggest union in their organization as a bunch of creeps. The uh, American Federation of Teachers, which had been supporting the SEIU, has now switched and they are also denouncing them. Uh, and I hear denounce them as the bosses union. We are having in the US today a a fight among the union leaders, basically over, they've got this little share of workers over here, and they're fighting over which union she's going to be in, and which union he is going to be in, and let me just say they're fighting dirty, they're, it's, it's, they have, they've hired bugs for some of the things, uh, you have to disrupt the meetings of the other side, it's, it's, I mean, labor to be fighting in the midst of a great recession, depression, is the most irresponsible, Horrific behavior. And thank goodness this is the front page of the New York Times today. This morning I woke up and I said, holy mackerel, this puts the lecture to the pig. Uh, and they're showing the workers here doing their normal thing. And the story is all about the service employees union fighting these other unions. And that's what's going on in the American labor movement. And so you get incredibly depressed. You sit there, I don't know how bad the German unions are, but I don't think they've reached this level. I know the British unions have not reached this level of just, it's, it's almost insanity of, of people. And uh, if you know some of these people, I'll say nothing personal about anybody, but it is not at all surprising, given who they are. That's all I can say. Uh, 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 um, if we had a rule that said, the every union leader over the age of, I don't know, 50 should be immediately replaced, and we should randomly pick a young union member. The unions would go through a wonderful transformation. Uh, uh, um, that, that, that's, so it, it's, it, it is a flawed institution. Uh, we know the banks and the financial guys are flawed. And then we look on the other side, we also see flaws. I think they have to do a major uh, set of changes, and I'll give you, um, they have to redefine their membership. Right now, the membership in the U.S. consists 
solely if people for whom who pay union dues and get a collective bargaining contract. So if I want to join one of the unions and I'm not covered by a contract, they don't want to see me. They'll, they'll take some money, actually. They'll take some money. But they don't want to deal with me. Uh, that was the basic thing. So this is a list of things of what they, they could be doing. Uh, and there's occasional unions. They have a, a, a small local at IBM that does some of these things. There is one organization that was doing this. I was one of the big surprises in, in my uh, uh, whatever the word is, giving advice to people. We, we had a bunch of students had, had, had a dinner at Harvard with the chief lawyer of the AFL-CIO. And we were preaching this kind of stuff. You've got to redefine your members, blah, 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 blah. There's some papers on the web you can find that were written with one of my colleagues. And the union guy was blubbering around. And, and, then, and then I said, you did something wonderful, AFL-CIO. And no one in this country has ever heard of it. Uh, when Enron crashed, the Enron employees lost everything. They lost their jobs. They lost their retirement, which was in the company pension fund, in which the, the president of the company was telling people, as he was getting rid of his shares, because he knew it was going down, he was telling workers, put more money in the company pension fund, basically, so the price goes up for the shares, and I can get more for my shares. I mean, unbelievable. They're a totally non-union company. They're in the middle of Texas. Their headquarters was in Houston. This is anti-union territory. AFL CIO, to their great credit, said, we've got to do something for all these workers who are getting screwed. They went to court, and they said, these workers deserve severance pay, which was in the company, like handbook, said they're going to get severance pay. No worker, when a company goes bankrupt in the US, ever gets severance pay. Never. Uh, because the judges sit there, and they say, look, it's not going to do anybody any good. We, uh, the usual thing is the people who you give money to are the companies that they are, or the senior creditors, they're called. And there's a set of people who get money. AFL CIO started a big ca a campaign. They got tens of, uh, I don't have the number here, but I'll say tens of thousands. I don't want to exaggerate. People to send internet emails to the judge. Uh, they had rallies. And in the end, the judge of the bankruptcy said that the company had to give these workers. It amounts to about $10,000, you know, depending on your pay and what they owed you and so on. This incredible success. So I went to the, I said the AFL service, this, this thing. I said, why don't you publicize this? This is the way the unions should do. You should be out there defending any kind of worker who gets screwed, and whether you're members or not. And, and he said to me, oh my god, we don't want our members to know about this. I said, why? They'll demand their dues back. They're paying for us to represent them. And I was like, you know, flabbergasted. And I said, and then I said, well, okay, you got all these workers at Houston, in Houston, in Enron, who you just you just cut checks for. They know you did this for them. What? How you signed them up? He said, well, we can't sign them up. We can't sign collective bargaining contracts for them because they're unemployed. They just lost their jobs. I said. Oh, so you just got them getting checks, and they're not going to be members of no organization. And I was just sort of, like I said, with the students, this thing worked, worked like really bad. Because <laughs> all, all this stuff is fact. I mean, there's not, not an issue. They never argued about this. And they started yelling at the uh, chief lawyer of the NFL CIO. And about six months later, he called me up and he said, oh, by the way, we've just formed this new organization. And you will be amazed to learn that people are joining in droves. Uh, and, and I said, oh, well, what's the, uh, the organization? It's called Working America. I, I couldn't find on their website their latest membership. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had two and a half million people. And they started you know, about three or four years ago, probably four years. I think it was the summer of 2004. So they're the fastest growing organization in the world. What did they do? They went door to door. And they said, well, we can't, if you're a union member, you cannot join, because you can't join this organization. We want you to sign up that you will be part of a national movement to basically write things in the country on behalf of workers. And they found people signing up like crazy. Right? Just saying, oh, somebody, you mean you're going to? And their workers have some, some, some rights. They got 200,000 people who signed up on the internet. Uh, um, some pay dues. Some of them they, they don't ask for dues, dues money for. Uh, and they're, gonna, they're, they're beginning now to raise more dues money. 
so they can be more, more self-sufficient. They didn't go to any big union states, which was fascinating. Why wouldn't you go to New York, uh, California, Massachusetts, Hawaii, which are big union states? They went to politically sensitive states uh, where they thought the Democrats would have troubles in the next election. So they had a huge operation in Ohio. In Pennsylvania, you, you see all the swing states that they spoke about in the election. That's where they. So they meant it was meant to be a political operation. Uh, 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 but they were selling it as we're here to help workers. And then they were shocked to find out 40% of the people who signed up were Republicans. Well, why not? 40% of the workers in the country are Republicans. Uh, 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 and uh, they found a lot of uh, fundamentalist Christians were signing up because uh, they, they did sort of surveys of people to find. And so they, they were suddenly reaching people that the union movement, over in this corner, were fighting over the three members, uh, had never reached. Um, their possibility for them is they could easily get to 10 or 15 million people. And the group in the US that has done this successfully is the uh, AARP, American Association of Retired People, which every person, when they reach the age of 50, gets an invitation. It's, you don't have to be retired. It's just you're, you're over 50, you ju you're given an invitation. They, the dues, I don't think they've raised them, $16 a year. It's like nothing. Uh, plus, you, you can get your spouse, at least in some of the offers they have, your spouse comes free. <laughs> and you can sign up for this. They have 35 million people. And what do they do? They don't collectively bargain. They go to the Congress. When the Congress threatens Social Security, <coughs> they sit down and they say, oh, you're threatening Social Security. 35 million Americans are about to vote against you. And they were probably the most important organization in stopping what would have been the greatest economic disaster uh, in, in the country. Bush wanted to privatize Social Security, uh, which meant that everybody's retirement money would have been in the stock market, which would have brought absolute disaster to the elderly the folks in the country. Um, it just would have been complete, complete disaster. And the, the AARP stopped it. Well, this organization, we're going to see. This, this union, remember, this union movement, they're fighting with each other. They're not thinking at this moment that, hey, we've got something that works. We found that people are willing to sign up. And what, what I've been proposing to them, no success, but we'll see. What, what, uh, we, you, keep, you keep coming back to them. Let's have some experiments. Let's find out what will work in some area with some of your, the, the members of this group. What services you can give them more. How you can do stuff with them. Maybe you can do something better. The, these are not the union leaders. These are the bankers. Um, you know, Citibank is over there. Um, uh, the hand is the hand of Wall Street. The guys on this other side are pretty scary. Uh, and, and, and truly, they are. Uh, when Mr. Markopoulos was reporting to the SEC, that, the, uh, that Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme, which the SEC ignored. And he sent them absolutely clear evidence of this. Uh, um, he sent them on Excel worksheets. And I was told that one reason they ignored them was that the real Wall Street guys, the quants, they don't use Excel. They have fancier programs. <laughs> yeah, you just sort of say, I can't believe this. Uh, uh, but that, so. He also said in, 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 and testified to this that he was truly afraid he was going to be murdered. That every time he did this, he was scared that they were going to, because so much money was involved. And uh, you know, no hitman ever got a, a brother in law like he knows him. And I have never met Mr. Mark Alba. He said, yeah, he's kind of a, you know, a nerdy, scared guy <laughs> in some sense. And you can understand being very nervous about this. And these, are, these are scary. Uh, people. Uh, so I conclude we will be able to build the capital system. Well, this is a little takeoff on, uh, on Sam Beckett. You, you know, it can't be done, it must be done, it will be done. And that's the Kelly Holmes who you saw racing. You, I, I didn't ask who you know her name. But Kelly Holmes is <laughs> the name of the lady. And she won in the, uh, the Olympic thing. And you see from her face, she did not anticipate winning. She's, she's a great runner. She won many great things. But every time all the pre this was her last Olympics, every time some injury would happen to her, some leg would thing. So she, she so this was it for her. And I think she was injured like, you know, three or four months before, 
and, and, and uh, so in Britain, at least I was in Britain at the time of that thing, she was the, the, the heroine of heroines. I mean, she was the thing. And then, just to show uh, she's the right kind of heroine in this world, she was called up by some famous movie star after the winning the race. And he said to her, um, uh, gee, uh, you know, you're, you're obviously a great athlete, so on. You're very attractive. Um, um, I'm going to send my private jet to pick you up so you can come to Hollywood and we can have a really fun date. And uh, so she says, should I do this or not? I think you're saying no. Well, I don't know. Then maybe there's some movie star you would say yes to. I don't know. Uh, and sadly, I don't know these movie stars. I don't know which, who it was. And, you know, I know it wasn't Cary Grant. He's dead. <laughs> 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 you know, but it was some modern, very famous movie star. And uh, she said no. She had agreed that week to go back to her high school in Britain to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, help inspire the other young kids, or she's not young, she's an adult, but the young kids to, 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 you know, to do track and field and so on. And she thought that was more important than having a date with a, with a rich uh, movie star. I just thought that when we were saying, well, why didn't he offer to fly over and, 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 you know, and meet her? The idea that you, you were so uh, you know, arrogant. <laughs> I'm a famous movie star. I'll send my jet, come on over. Uh, uh, to this. She's, now a, uh, she's now called Dame Kelly Holmes because they gave her a, a, a knighthood. And, uh, but she surprised everybody, and she did it. And so I always think whenever one feels depressed, I have a whole bunch of pictures of her, and I look at those pictures I face. So I did it. Uh, and you say, yeah, if you can do it. So can a lot of, 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 other, uh, of other people. Um, but right now, I must say, the, the American unions, if they're going to take a lead in this, boy, uh, they're going to have to get out of this corner where they're, you know, there's a word they use. It's slightly sexist, but I'll just use it because it, it, it kind of fits. They were usually referred to women fighting. They call it cat fight. Uh, and, and that's what these union leaders are doing. They're pulling each other's hair. They're trying to kick each other. They're fighting in a very, um, it's undignified and, uh, 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 um, and totally irresponsible. Uh, um, so I would have loved to have said, gee, well, here's the working America. The unions are putting lots of resources into it. We're going to have a very strong countervailing group. And the fact is, they're busy kicking each other over, uh, you know, who's going to organize some small number of workers someplace uh, in, in this. I don't think any of the other unions in the world are quite in that uh, shape. And I don't, and if, if Mr. In the, the New York Times article this morning was, gee, Obama has put pressure on the two union federations that we have in our country to come together so that a unified labor group. Um, he's going to put a lot of money down, a lot of political capital to get some labor law thing. These guys may just screw the whole thing so we won't end up with the labor law thing. Because, boy, if I'm a conservative opponent of this, I know what I've got. I just quote what one union leader said about the other. And then I say, do we want to give these guys power to, to affect the US economy? They're not behaving uh, you know, responsibly. Um, so I'm proposing we bring Kelly Holmes over and make her the leader of our, our trade union um, uh, uh, you know, movement. Uh, we would do much better with somebody, I think, just chosen from the, the, the audience of union people. Uh, um, they won't do that. Uh, 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 I once was going to actually propose that in a New York Times editorial piece, and they, and they threatened me. Uh, not, not, not in a nasty way, they just said, do you want us to ever talk to you again or listen to you? I said, well, um, yeah, I really do, because I think it'll do some good. Then they said, then don't propose this. <laughs> and I said, OK. Because I realized it was like, you know, you're making a gesture saying, I think you guys are such jerks that I do think that. <laughs> but, but knowing that it's not going to affect them, there's no point of being, a, you know, making a symbolic thing that, uh, uh, that, 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 that doesn't do any good. Um, I would say that, I haven't talked to the president about this, but if I do, I would say that, and very bluntly, assuming none of those guys are in the audience, or, or you know, sitting there as well, I could say it very gently, but you really want to say this human movement needs a major overhaul, and it's got to start at the top, and it's got to, it's got to, it's got to 
just change and it's got to really empower workers um, rather than union leaders representing <coughs> workers. The German trade unions have some of this kind of thing as, as, as well, I, I believe, but they're not quite as bad as I. Okay, thank you. I don't know what, what should I do next? Do you want to object to questions that, yeah, object to something or. <laughs> Maybe somebody could say, the unions in my country are behaving just optimally. Yeah. Yes. There's a door open there, and I had the door open, and I think the president, first president probably since um, Harry Truman, who's favorable to unions in the US. Um, and he is willing to, do, he wants to see guys go through that door, and they're not doing it. Uh, they are really uh, potentially blowing the whole ship. So I, I, I don't think that's even bashing. I think that's uh, a, and, and let me just say, most of this stuff has been kept out of the press, uh, so that the the union fights have been kept as private as they can. Uh, but inside the union movement, you'll hear a zillion times worse than I said, uh, because people, members, and people are absolutely upset. Here, you've got the opportunity, and you are possibly going to blow it. And I feel even deeper because I think if they don't step up. NGOs are not going to step up. Church groups are not going to step up. They have to be the, the main leading force. And some of them do this. I mean, the, the, the environmental thing, they, 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 the steel workers used to be totally anti-environment, are now working you know, on green stuff all across the And uh, so it's not that the whole union movement is, 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 is whatever the right word is, is, is fighting over, there's only two members left here. So I don't know what that. Uh, you know, people say it. Um, but the, but the, and, and, and I think you can't, you, what's the right word? You're going to be critical of the bankers and all, and, and for, you know, screwing up and so on. You can't paint the, the side that we're hoping is the countervailing power is, is anything but what they are. And, and, and so I, the working America, I applaud all, all over the place. I'm their greatest friend, they tell me. Uh, because they have actually done something risky and they've succeeded. And I keep telling the woman who heads it up, you should go into the bloody office of the AFLCR president and say, I represent more people than anybody else. I want a seat on the executive council. She doesn't have it because she doesn't collect uh, the standard dues and run and collect the bargaining contracts. So she's considered head of a, of a near union, not quite a union, which is, to me is, is crazy. Uh, 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 you know, you got more members than all the rest of these guys. Uh, that that is that, that is great. And so, in any case, I, it's I, I wish I didn't. I wish I did not have to sort of end the the the, the, the union party lecture the way I did. Um, the first discussion of that June thirtieth was was email being sent among union activists. But that was the the fact that it got in the Times just was. And I, I'm glad it is, because that will alert, the, I think, the president and the other people. And uh, they've got to, these guys have got to be literally t told, you cannot behave like this. You have got to be, a, 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 you, you're, you're letting go a serious opportunity. Now, 
we had some issues of a similar kind in the Great Depression. You, 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 John L. Lewis you know, uh, went to a union thing and punched, knocked down uh, the head of the Carpenters Union, Bill Hutchison. Um, and then they stormed out and they formed the, uh, the CIO, which, which, and then the art unions competing grew massively at, 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 you know, at that particular time. The, right, the change to wing group was already, was sort of meant to mimic that. And now they're the group that's dissolving in fights over who gets who and what. And so you're, I don't think we have another chance to pull for one union group to say, hey, we're going to go out there and, 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 and do stuff. So if they blow up, which they're doing before our eyes, that is going to be a disaster for the unions. They're not going through it, through that door. And, um, you know, if they did this after cards, what I had hopes was people would just ignore them. And they would just form new, brand new unions formed by young workers and so on. And, you, and a lot of that happened in the, in the Great Depression in the US. A lot of the unions just, workers just formed them, boom. And I think there's ways to do that. And the working America has a certain of a flavor of that. Uh, um, but if they don't get the EFCA through, which I don't think they will, they're going to get some election procedure through, is my guess. Uh, for that, you need union lawyers and you need union help to run one of these election campaigns. And these guys, where's the help they're going to give? And would you want their help? I, I, we want a union. And uh, so, so one, one, one union's going to send its guys, the other union's going to send its guys, and they're going to stand there and fight each other <laughs> instead of, instead of organizing. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think you'll see a lot more of this in the U.S. And, and, and it'll all be from the friends of the unions who are saying, God almighty, how can we do this at this moment? But for example, Hedden, uh, say you run a very um, successful uh, organizing campaign with janitors? They've run, the SEIU's run a couple of these. Otherwise, most of their growth has come through public sector workers. They've done very good stuff, but they, it turns out, are at the heart of this dispute. They have a, let me just be, the, 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 um, a group of, nur of nur nurses groups in, in California who joined the SEIU. They, they took away their, their democratic uh, charter and the point, they tried to appoint uh, headquarters from Washington people to run the union. That's, uh, there's a big fight going on over there. SEIU has now decided that uh, some of the other unions inside the change to win they want to take over. And so this whole, this is a split. It is SEIU, you're absolutely right. And what they're losing is any of their credentials as the best and most effective union. And it's terrible. If you know their staffers, my, my sense is they're the best people we have in the union movement. And they can't, uh, you know, and they're being basically undercut by their top leadership. How can they look at what you know, it's, they, are, they, they, they I mean, If I was a conservative, I would just publicize a, fair, a lot of things they did, uh, which union, got, union people have been keeping it sort of under wraps. <laughs> it, it really is old fashioned Jimmy Hoffa style stuff. And the fact that they now have Jimmy Hoffa's son <laughs> opposing them, oh boy. Uh, so you just don't know what they, what's going to happen happen next, and that's and, and and if you're a conservative, you're going to sit there and say card checks when these guys are sending goon squads to beat up uh, uh, organizations of other uh, of, of of union dissidents. This is it's oh, I, I don't I mean I'll, I'll be very, I, I'll get sharper and sharper because it is really a sin what, what they're doing. Uh, No, I do think it's more structural than it is personality. 
uh, the, of the, the, these guys have been beaten down. They, they are very defensive. And they, um, it's a very peculiar profession. You rise up to be head of a, of a trade union, and you're fighting all the way. Um, and then you find your movement is shrinking, and you get desperate. Um, and Andy Serdan like had some good ideas and had some good, uh, absolutely good things. And then he decided, well, everybody's got to do this, and they got to do it under my leadership. Um, and John, he, 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 the parallel of John Lewis is. Extremely interesting. The guy who punched out because he was a major figure, and then in the end, he, he ended up isolated in the in the union uh, movement. And uh, looks like Andy's going to be isolated as well. And what he may be fighting, I don't know. Internally, is the following: the, the president's pushed the two union federations to come together, um, and uh, which Trump is going to become head of the new group. Maybe Andy doesn't like that. And so maybe he's playing a, you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the head or something. I'm going to make, I, I, but I, I, I mean, the, 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 the personal thing that I downplay, it, it's the structure of a group that is, feels the business is collapsing <laughs> and that they've been marginalized and they shouldn't feel that now. They've got a president, it, it's just like, can't they make a jump in their heads to say, wait a minute, we've got a president an administration that actually wants us to be strong, wants to help us. I, I, I need this psychiatrist, maybe you need some psychiatrist. Like, There's another question, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you, you spoke about the financial elites and then about different institutions that trade unions and NGOs and all that. Uh, and somehow opposed to be the alternative. And uh, you mentioned the state's role. Right. Is this the only role of the state uh, in the current situation? Um, yes, but, but if, if the state gives incentives, that'll be a huge transformation. The state has been basically uh, giving disincentives as much as it can. So if it gives incentives, that'll be a huge change. There, are, I mean, there are different ways you can give incentives. You can announce, as the president did, was that if we're going to have construction projects. Uh, basically, we want union labor. He didn't quite phrase it that way, but the, the, the whole meaning was we want union labor on those construction projects. If we're going to have recovery packages, uh, we're going to we're, we're not going to give money to uh, companies that are engaged in anti-union campaigns as part of our recovery. So the state could be very active in setting incentives. And I think that's the 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 the, 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 the truth. Um, but it's going to be incredibly hard for them to be that way if the union movement looks like a mess, uh, 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 um, which uh, sadly enough, it's, it's gotten worse, I would say, in the last six months, for whatever reason, it's gotten really bad. And so we may see unions suing unions. Uh, so using members' dues to, to sue another union on something, and, and just, you know, when you need a big organizing campaign, that's what you should be doing. If you're doing stuff, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, it's just terrible. It's, 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 yes? Yeah, um, you mentioned um, social networks um, as a possibility to build a counterweight in power, and I think this is um, especially after this uh, yeah, impressive uh, election campaign by Obama. Um, uh, I think a great, a great idea, but sometimes I, I feel that especially these social networks tend to address this very specific for example, like fighting against uh, Starbucks, and it's very specific. And yeah. I don't know if it, if it would be really provide like an integrational factor for uh, a, a broad movement. So that's a, I don't know either. That's a great question. I mean, the work in America is meant to be a broad movement, and the one thing that they do is they, like in the, you know, I don't know, Oregon, they fought for a higher minimum wage in the state because that's what members told them the most. Some other places they fight for more uh, spending on schools. And uh, so they, you know, you join, a, in, in that case, you join a broad movement. And then, I, I don't know the, the, the right number. They, won't find, they, they probably don't know the right number either. But of the 2.5 million members, 
Maybe 1% are active, maybe. Uh, but of course, if you have a huge membership, uh, or 1% of a huge membership is very powerful. And, and when they, when, before they formed this organization, they, they, when they had the people send email things to the bankruptcy judge in Enron, they, there was the biggest email bombard you know, ever in the history of the courts in the US. And you know, it was probably 1% or 2% of, 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 of the list of people that they asked to participate. It was bigger now because the Enron was a big thing. But it was, certainly was not the, you know, So having a big, broad thing gives you this incredible power if you're fighting Starbucks, you identify the, the modest number of people. But if it's a big group of, of, of people you're picking from, you're really able to do something. And, and, and you think about it in different cities. Uh, you don't need that many people to cause uh, an uproar. Let me give an example. Because companies, the unions have been very, the unions and SEI has been very good at this. Because uh, they do run very good capital campaigns. What you do is, you think this company is paying the CEO too much. You buy some shares of the company, and you appear at the meeting of the shareholders, and you raise issues. The, the, the CEOs hate this. Uh, you know, you say, well, Joe, how come you're paying yourself $5 million when the shares fell by 50% this year? And all the other shareholders are saying, yeah, that's right. Well, how come you're doing that? They hate this. And this, this last spring, the unions have been the most successful they ever have in, 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 in shareholder activism things. And, and, and that's, a, that's a teeny number of union people involved in that. I mean, it's, 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 but what you do is you send an email uh, uh, thing in, to every union that has shares in this company, and you say, uh, you know, vote your shares this way, the unions will. And then you say maybe send one person to the meeting and suddenly there are 15 people at the meeting, all of whom are booing or hissing the CEO. And, 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 and a lot of these CEOs, they just don't like that at all. And then they'll come and say, well, what, what, what really do you want from us? And then you can have some discussion with, 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 with them. Um, so I, 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 so I, I think you're absolutely correct. But if you have a big enough membership you can always find the people for a particular campaign. And uh, the internet means, that's like businesses. I, could, I can have a, you know, I don't know, some weird record that I like. And uh, you know, I can never find it any place. And now on the internet, because there's you know, 0, 0, 0.001% of the people in the world like the same artist, there's, there's actually a place we can get it. And we can find it, because enough, there's enough of us accumulated. So I think the social networking is a similar similarity to that. I think. Yeah. Next conversation is you said it, which is I, I find it really correct to move beyond this uh, boundaries of what is covered by collective bargaining agreements. Uh, but do you see any future for this traditional union role as uh, I mean in terms of collective bargaining, oh, bargaining oh. corporations? Because I mean union that's is not the only factor which says about the the union right. strength of course was traditionally also this collective bargaining coverage and in some countries like, like in Poland, I mean, it's, it's, it's still this additional factor which, which, which uh, shows how weak unions are actually because of very low coverage of, 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 of uh, Now, no, I don't know. The collective bargaining really should be part of the union package that they're, that they're on offer. When they can get that, they should do it. Um, it shouldn't be the only thing you've got. And if you don't get that, you, you, you disappear. disappear. It's also, I think, and some of the unions will, will back me up on this, that if you're doing collective bargaining and you have a lot of non, you have a lot of members in the, in the uh, like working America, they love this. They, because they're able to go in and say, oh, and by the way, uh, there's 50,000 members of this organization in this city and they, they will get very bad news about you. They don't work for you, but they're your customers. <laughs> They're, 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 you know, they're your people, and, and no, no firm wants to have 50,000 people send an email that says they're a stinker, don't buy at them, or whatever they'll be saying to, about them. And again, even if only a few uh, respond, uh, you know, it's enough to, to, to get people to, 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 to react. So I think it's a duel. You have the, the two things. And uh, it depends on what workers want and what you can get from the employers. The employer, you can't get a collective contract from the employer. Okay, you don't go away, you stay there. And you say, these are our members, 
And we're going to deal with you in other ways. And if you're, you know, it's sort of, they did this with this Enron. But, you know, the bottle of the mind. They did it for non-union workers. They spent a lot of big union uh, legal, you know, talent on it. And then they kept it all secret because they were afraid their members, and every time I speak to the union members, I say, you know the unions did this, what do you think? And they're all saying, yeah, they did something, huh? Uh, uh, you know, they, 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 actually, union members love this. And, and that goes to show that the Washington leadership doesn't, doesn't truly, I think, appreciate that their members are way ahead of them in, in, in actually thinking, you know, and in, 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 in progressive, in, sort of, in, in living in the modern world. I mean, not insulting anybody, but uh, John Sweeney, who is going to be retiring as head of the AFL-CIO, uh, is doubtful that he knows what a computer is. Uh, <laughs> he certainly does not have email. Uh, 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 you know, but he's a pretty old guy, and you know, he's your grandfather maybe or something, and 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 and, and, and he's a very nice man, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but the leadership is, we have, I don't know if the oldest in the world, but it is US labor union leadership is much older I know, than the British union leadership. I mean, our, our guys are in their 60s uh, on average and, and 70s. There's no retirement age. And so they hang on until basically they are, you know, it's, uh, the, the mortuary calls them up and they say, oh, I guess I'll give up my years in leadership. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and the next part of it, the movement that's isolated, and where where they're not part of a broader thing, where you'd say that so, I mean, there's some union leaders who become university professors, but they're rare and far between because they are the kind of people that can move to any other place and be uh, you know be a useful person. But, okay. So. Uh, okay, uh, let, let, let's do the last one, I think, if okay. Um, you have mentioned uh, employees of companies and plus uh, also about unions that are having share with, in the company. Uh, do you see uh, some kind of trend for the future that you to contemplate? Well, the, uh, the in, 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 in employee ownership, um, written, written broadly, I want to be, be careful. It's not just owning a company, because profit sharing system means you have a ownership over some of the profits in some sense, and it's part of your. If you have a union, it's part of your collective agreement. You get some of the profits. That, that's the same. I, I very broadly this shared thing involves not just employee ownership, but profit sharing, which is bigger, uh, gain sharing, which is another mechanism. It's all systems by which, if the company does well, the workers benefit. But if the company does poorly, the workers do lose something. I mean, it's, it's, there's risk involved, so they may understand that. Um, I would have said, until this crisis, it clearly was going up. And you had more and more companies seeing it. You get young, educated workers. You've got to motivate them. It's not having guys go to an assembly line and we watch them. How do we motivate them? We motivate them by giving them possibilities of, of, of profitability and so on. And you get br br bright young uh, uh, engineers and people. They want to have, they'll ask you in the years, say, well, what's my stake? I want to have some shares in the company. I, I don't want to be a, just, a paid, just a paid employee. Now, it may change given this crisis. Because people in that boat clearly, as the companies are not profitable, they took a beating. So you didn't make any money on that. And we'll, we'll, that'd be very interesting if we do the 2010 survey to see and we're going to ask them some new questions about how the crisis has affected your views of, of, you know, of, 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 of this. It's, it, I think it is a future because it's the high tech firms who are in the, in the lead in this. Uh, you know, it's the most modern uh, progressive firms. So, so, so uh, on the, um, the other part, which is the union ownership of shares through pension funds. Um, the union pension funds are huge in the U.S., and I don't see them getting any s smaller. I mean, they, they declined with the stock market, of course. Their whole, everybody's pension is worth less than it, than it was. And I think there's an incredible opportunity, because a lot of people have these 401k plans, which are 
basically controlled by the um, brokerage firms, the same Wall Street guys who've done everything else. And here's a, a scheme I tried to sell the unions. They did not, were not in the least bit interested, but that they set up their own national 401k plan. So workers around the country could go and put their, say, I don't want my money with Merrill Lynch or with City Corps. I want it with a union fund that will uh, vote. The key thing is voting the shares in the companies. Because right now, my, I, I have a 401k, it's the unit at Harvard University, that's what we do. And uh, my shares are voted by the stockbrokers. And they're always voted, I'm sure, for management, because I pay no attention. Because I know I can't afford to vote. How many shares do I have? But it's got to be a whole group of people who vote for shares. And the unions could do that too. So I think there's great opportunity for them to, to, to it's spreading out outside the collective bargaining people, saying to other people, look, we're going to vote your shares in the best interests of you, not in the best interests of the brokerage firms or the management, which is the way shares have been uh, voted in, in large part. I mean, this means changing the corporate governance, and, and that is part of any reform package. And the unions have been very good on that, but it's a small number of, SEIU in particular has been very good, it's a small number of union folks who are leading a, a sort of a crusade successfully to, to, to do things there. Okay, I think. Sure. <laughs> probably no, but basically you have to think of country by country because most of the labor things are country specific and uh, there, there really is no EU, I mean, there's a you know, EU, TUC or whatever, uh, there's some groups, but they really have no power or, or authority and everything is very national um, and I don't know of any country that is or a group that has got some great ideas from the union side. I, 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 I know the Brits pretty well. I, I, know the, I know something about the Germans. I mean, I, the Swedes, they, they, they're always in the forefront of some things. On this one, I, 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 I mean, is there any, any, do they have any um, useful plans? <laughs> <laughs> The center right is in power now, so even if they have great ideas, uh, we don't have a lot of clue. Okay. Well, yeah, that's lots of rethinking. Rethink well, I mean, the, the, the rethinking to me is very important because if, if, when you get into power, you don't have any ideas. You're not. There's going to be a meeting. The EU unions have called for a meeting in Rome on October 29th and 30th, and they're going to have the the global union federations and the whole bunch. And that is meant to be some sort of rethinking. And I have no idea whether it's going to, you know, it's going to be bureaucratic or whether it is actually going to be some serious. They did not send any documents about what they are thinking about. Um, so I, I don't know what I'm going to say. Whether I'm going to yell at them or something and say, "Hey guys, you're not, you're not. Come on, this is your opportunity." But at least they're not fighting each other like the American guys. You could say, this is an opportunity because the financial forces that really have run the capitalist system for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, they, they gained more and more power. They screwed up so badly that the door is open for some systemic changes that we hope will be better. Uh, um, I have a lot of faith in John Monks, who's the head of the, uh, the, the, the European Trade Union Congress. He's extremely smart and thoughtful. 
Um, but but the, you know, when he's head of the British TUC, he could actually do something. Head of the European TUC, it's it's difficult to, to, to get things done. Uh, he certainly has a lot of, uh, and his staff, they have a lot of very detailed analyses of the financial problems and what some changes they would like to see. Um, and, you know, and maybe he'll convince lots of people and the, the Europeans will come together uh, on this. We brought, we brought him to Harvard to, to hear what thoughts were from the European to TUC, and uh, he made it very, he's just a very smart guy. And uh, one of the American Negro people said to me, come on, you're not fooling me. I said, what do you mean I'm not fooling you? We're fooling you. He's not a union leader. <laughs> he's, he's a professor, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, because he's really knowledgeable and so on. So in Britain, he was on the radio literally every day making commentary on things because everybody realized that this was a union leader who actually knew more than the government guys or the business guys. And, he wanted him. and our guys, you never hear them on the radio because you don't have anybody whom you could actually expect to address these things. So we'll, we'll know at the end of October whether they, 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 they got an act together. At least they're calling a meeting, to, you know, a big meeting in Rome with lots of people to move something. Thanks.